Hey, my name is Michael Goncher. I'm one of the editors of the New York Times Learning Network, and we are broadcasting right now from the ninth floor of the south side of the New York Times building. Uh, I'm joined here by my colleagues at the Learning Network, and we also have on the line right now some teachers and students from Danvers, Massachusetts, who uh, use the New York Times Learning Network and are writing prompts regularly to, for teaching and learning. So uh, let me begin by talking. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with the Learning Network, but you can find us by going to the New York Times homepage and in the upper left-hand corner, you click a button, you scroll down, you click another button, and then maybe you can find the Learning Network there. The other way to do it is to just to go to your favorite search engine, or even better, to bookmark us. Uh, we are part of NewYorkTimes.com, and our goal every single day is to help teachers and students uh, to teach and to learn with the New York Times. We've been around since 1998. And at the top of our page, you can see the four featured articles or resources or lesson plans that we're featuring for the day. And below that, you can see our kind of widgets. Uh, in the first row, we have a whole bunch of activities for students. That's mostly what we're going to be talking about today, uh, particularly our writing prompts, but uh, some other features as well that are very uh, uh, good tools for helping students to get writing. And then below that, which we won't really be talking about today, we have a whole bunch of lesson plans. We encourage you to click on the subject that, that's most relevant to you and um, and you can find our resources there. So if you clicked on that orange widget on our site, you can get to our writing prompts. And for starters, uh, we're gonna be talking about, I'm gonna be speaking about our student opinion questions and, and Catherine Schulten, my colleague, is gonna be speaking about our writing prompt, our, our picture prompts, which are image-based prompts. Uh, our student opinion questions, we're the New York Times, and so you would expect, perhaps, that we would be dealing with issues like the State of the Union Address, and sure enough, we have a question uh, connected to that. Uh, how would you uh, describe the state of our union? Uh, we also had a, a, a prompt earlier this week about the photograph that was on the yearbook page of the Virginia governor. Uh, I'm not sure if you're following that story, but we also deal with other topics as well, such as um, boredom and we and, and whether students listen to podcasts and how much do you know about your family's history. So we, we really cover the range of topics and we try to pick subjects that we think are interesting to students and are relevant to the curriculum. The anatomy of our student opinion questions uh, essentially follows a certain template for the most part, uh, every, every time we publish a new student opinion, a student opinion question, we begin with a hook. So for this question about uh, are straight A's always a good thing, it begins with a hook and then it leads into an excerpt from a Times article or a Times opinion piece. In this case, it was an opinion piece written by Adam Grant, an organizational psychologist. Uh, it was an op-ed called What Straight A Students Get Wrong. And we had almost 200 students respond to this. Um, after we after we have this excerpt of a few paragraphs that we pulled from the article that we think are interesting and relevant and to help students get a feel for the topic and to give them some ideas that they can bounce off of and use within their responses, we then ask a series of sub-questions. So, for example, uh, one of our sub-questions for this prompt was, do you think there's too much emphasis on grades? Are there qualities and skills that you possess that are not reflected in your grades? Our goal for these uh, sub-questions or deeper thinking questions is to encourage students to be uh, more detailed in their responses to help them dig a little bit deeper and to come up with more sophisticated and more substantial responses. And then at the bottom of the prompt, we invite students to comment. So there's a link for commenting and um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But before we before we go on, I'd like to ask you another question. Um, this was one of the questions we asked during the last school year. Should the voting age be lowered to 16? Let me give you a few seconds to answer that. We've got absolutely yes, let's expand our democracy to more teenagers. Definitely not. 16-year-olds are not mature enough to vote. And then finally, I have mixed feelings about this. So let's see what everyone says. Okay. <laughs> about two-thirds of you said, I have mixed feelings about this. Now, let me, let me say that we never ask our students uh, on the learn who come to the Learning Network a poll question like this. In, in, we did this for fun because we're on a webinar, but in reality, we ask students to write substantial responses. And so here you can see some examples of what students wrote. 
it's, it's, it's hard to read because the text is small, but you can see perhaps that we have students from all over the country. So right here is a mix of students from California, from Maine, from uh, Washington, and I think somebody actually from Danvers, who are folks at Danvers, I'm sure recognize. Uh, let me also point out that the capability of the New York Times commenting system is that students can register for free. You don't need to be a subscriber. It probably takes 30 seconds. Um, it's very quick and easy. And once you registered by putting in your name and where you're from, and, and students don't even need to put in their full name if they don't want, they can have a username, then they can participate in our comments on our site, and they can actually read what other students have to say and respond to them. So for this question that we asked, is it ethical to create genetically edited humans? We have um, Michelle from Wilmington, North Carolina saying, I do believe the promise of eradicating diseases is too good a promise to give up. And then we have Natasha from Bryant, Arkansas, responding back to, uh, to Michelle, gene editing is a high risk, high return thing, but I don't think it's worth the risk. To say otherwise is dangerously optimistic in my eyes. And those are just excerpts from what they wrote. They wrote much more, but they're having an online conversation and for those of you who are worried about if you put teenagers onto the New York Times site uh, and let them come, and what will they say? So I just want to emphasize that, first of all, we are overwhelmingly impressed with the students who comment on our site. And second of all, we moderate for, uh, to make sure that, that students are following the New York Times commenting guidelines. So that means we do not allow students to say, oh, you don't know how to spell or check your grammar or that's stupid. We don't, we, we reject those comments that we get. And, um, and any student who has something that's polite to say and civil, even if it's an unpopular position, will approve it and will allow it to go public. And uh, that's really important to the mission of our site that students can have a conversation across the country, even across the world. And sometimes it's important even within our own city. So we're in New York City and we have schools from all different neighborhoods and all ranges of different types of schools. And so you can have students from the Manhattan and, and, and students from Manhattan or the Bronx from Queens having a conversation just as easily as from Chicago and Little Rock and Houston. We publish writing prompts, uh, student opinion prompts, every single school day since 2009, and that means we have well over a thousand, and we've we've gathered these into a whole bunch of different lists. So last week we published a new list, 100 plus writing prompts to explore common themes in literature and life. We also have a prompt list for narrative and personal writing. Uh, we have a, a publication, 401 prompts for argumentative writing. We even have the mother of all lists, over 1,000 writing prompts for students. Each of these is linked to our original uh, student opinion question, and they're all then linked to a free New York Times article that, um, that, that you can get a gateway to from the Learning Network. And we've categorized all these lists to make them more useful for teachers and students, such as social by categories like social media, overcoming adversity, or the what if questions. For example, what if uh, I had a superpower or what if I won the lottery? So let me hand it over to Catherine Schulten, my colleague uh, at the Learning Network, to talk about picture prompts. Hi, guys, and thank you very much for everybody who has been writing in the chat. That is a blast to write you back, but I'm not sure my fingers were fast enough. Um, we know that the New York Times is a difficult text for many students, uh, especially maybe the students in your class who, for whom English is not their first language. So even though we've been asking a student opinion question every day since 2009, a couple of years ago we started something new that we call picture prompts because we wanted to give a second place, uh, a second daily prompt that's just uh, more image-based that really invites the world to respond. So um, it is always centered around a great image from the New York Times. There's not much text, but just like anything that we, you know, any other feature we have, it links out to something else in the Times that day, and the link is there by free. Um, so I'm going to show you, we have different varieties of these. There are four different kinds. We try very hard to do all four every week, and at the end of the year, we kind of wrap these up. Uh, I'll, I'll take you through each of them. Um, sometimes we ask kids to, uh, the classic picture prompt, right? Write a story from this. Where does your imagination take you? Um, sometimes we do one where we have an illustration that almost works like a political cartoon, and I'll show you one. The Times Opinion um, section has tons of original illustration every day, and teachers love to have kids uh, analyze that. Sharing a personal story, that's probably my favorite because it's so easy and we get such amazing stuff from kids. 
And then, of course, we privilege argument because we know, at least here in the U.S., that the Common Core asks kids to make arguments in all kinds of contexts. And so we do that in our picture prompts as well. Um, so I'm going to show you a few. You'll get the sense. Here's, uh, here's one where we ask them to tell a story. What story could this image tell? And we say they can write the opening of a short story or a poem inspired by what they see. Oh, my God, we love reading what we get from these. You just never know what direction they're going to go in. So there's, there's one. Um, this one was from last week, and this is more along the lines of a personal story. This was a beautiful essay from the opinion section. Uh, well, it was in, the picture comes from it, um, about what a rescue dog has meant in this one woman's life. So we asked, do you know a rescue pet? What's the animal like? And how has it impacted the lives of those it lives with? And uh, students could write about their own rescue pet, but they can also access that beautiful essay after they're done. Um, okay. Uh, the argumentative ones, um, those are harder to come up with a picture. We do those constantly in our student opinion question. But here's a perfect example. Um, should parents use smart devices to keep tabs on their children when they're home alone? And I mean, you know, this doesn't inspire you to talk about uh, big brother and in the form of your parents. I don't know what, excuse me, what would. Um, and then this last one, I don't know how well you can see this image, but this is a pretty classic opinion section image. Um, you might see that that's Donald Trump to the far right. And I, I'll say no more about what you're seeing here, but this is one we used last, uh, two weeks ago, maybe. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the image is saying? How does it relate to and comment on current events in our society? And what's your opinion of the message? Those are pretty much the standard questions we ask every time. And, you know, interpretations are always all over the uh, map, and we love that. So um, in the last two years, we have started to get we, – we started getting so many amazing responses from students all over the world every week that we kind of thought it was a shame that – you know, because to ourselves, there's four of us, and we're, like, chortling away in our cubicles and, like, put in our Slack channel saying, look at this great thing a kid wrote. And we, we were like, we need to share this with the whole world. So we started something we call Current Events Conversation, which is essentially choosing what we think are the best comments every week and calling those kids out. We put their names in bold. Um, we, we sometimes call out the whole school because we'll have schools like Danvers, who you're going to hear from, who uh, range across all of our prompts, and you'll see their kids on like eight different prompts that week. And, and we just wanted uh, students and teachers to know we're listening. Nothing goes up on our site that we haven't read, and some of them just delight us so much that we decide to call them out. So um, here's an example. Um, I think this was the last week's, and we'll have another one up tomorrow. They go up on Thursdays. And we say what students are saying about, and then we pick three things that really kind of blew up that week. Um, last week, it was how to treat robots. Apparently, people are beating robots up. Um, you know, a thing to know. And kids uh, had a lot to say about that. Resilient, classic uh, classroom conversation. And then the notion of ghosting somebody on social media, which kids also obviously had a lot to say about. Um, we have heard from teachers that students are go wild when their names are called out. You can see here that uh, they're hyperlinked to their actual comment. Um, and we've heard from teachers across the country that uh, kids love to open up, the, up our site on Thursdays <clears throat> to get excited for each other, even if their comment wasn't picked that week. Um, and I, I do want to say that as a team, we don't just pick like, you know, grammatically perfect comments. That's not what we're about. We're really, we see voice, we see a lot of spirit, we see an original idea or a, a original opinion that not every other kid is saying, or we see a kid responding to another kid. Oh, we're going to call that out. Those are behaviors we want to, um, you know, we want to get more of. So, um, so I have a little story to tell you by way of introducing our guests, which is that we uh, reached out to Danvers because so many their students were on our site so much that I think it, I think I wrote an email maybe to the principal and said, whoever's at Danvers, can you write me back? Like your kids are great, and then that's how we hooked up with these people. But in that context, um, we actually learned that there was a student who was so excellent last year at commenting and wrote such, like, uh, I don't know how to 
phrase this except to say they were emotionally thoughtful comments. Like they were very intelligent. They were very, you know, you could tell she did the reading, but they all also were just such sensitive comments about issues like race where sensitivity is really important that we called this girl out in a special way and said, Megan Moralia, whoever you are, thank you for a year of great comments. Well, that's all we did. We never heard from her, but we learned that she was a Danvers student and that she had been so excited by being called out that this summer she came to New York from Massachusetts and took a picture of herself in front of the New York Times building. And we're so sad that she didn't um, phone us up because we would have loved to like buy this young woman lunch. Megan, we would still love to buy you lunch. So um, I'm going to pass. I'm going to now introduce to you the team from Danvers, who's calling in from Danvers. So we hope the line works. Um, and we have the teacher John White and uh, Jay McGillan, who uh, use the prompts regularly. And then we have Megan herself, uh, who did the prompts last year, and then Ezra, who's in the class this year, who we call out frequently as well for his excellent contributions. So welcome, you guys. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Can you hear us? Sure can. Yeah, so welcome all right. welcome to all of you. And and so maybe John and Jay, you can just begin by telling us your story about how you use the site, how you use these prompts in your class, what you teach, and what your experience has been. Yeah, absolutely. Our um, curriculum director a couple of years ago uh, had introduced it. He was in another school and they were using the New York Times. So brought it to us and you know, um, the context in which we're talking about today is mainly in the AP language and composition, but I will say that the writing prompts, you know, um, I'll use with other classes. Additionally, a number of different resources that you have on your website, um, such as, you know, the Times machine, if we're reading The Catcher in the Ride, to be able to go back to the New York Times and look up any articles about J.D. Salinger to um, contextualize, you know, his life or the, the life of the author or um, in our study of the things they carried, and we'll be looking at Vietnam, um, that era, and again, to use the the Times machine to go back and read some articles from the front page of the newspaper while, um, you know, the Vietnam War was at its height. Um, that is a really valuable tool for students. Um, I'm using, you know, some of the poetry, uh, the blackout poetry we're working on right now. So there's a number of different ways in which we use the site, but what we're kind of focusing on today is our use of um, this in the AP Lang class. And what what we are doing in the past is there are certain prompts on the AP Lang exam in which they're, they're thinking prompts as much as they're writing prompts. Students have to be able to come up with an argument on demand, and they're not giving given or provided different sources for that that prompt. Um, instead, they have to rely on a number of things, you know, their their knowledge from what they studied in school and life experience and whatnot. But the one thing we wanted to continue to expose them to was the were current events. And um, what we found was the New York Times prompts lent themselves to that to, to give them a chance to go through to respond to current events and um, to begin to think about issues that they might be able to later reference as they're trying to build an argument that is is framed in some kind of context um, within you know the world in which we live. So it it just really started to take off as you mentioned. Um, more and more students were they had a sense of pride I think in responding not only you know to writing for their teacher writing for the class. Um, we use Google Classroom a lot and. People will respond to questions in Google Classroom, but it's different when you're writing to a global audience. And you know that there's a lot of people out there who are reading your writing. Um, and then it even, as you mentioned, you know, the, the pride in the students and then the parents where I, you know, I had um, a parent, I think I was telling you about when we spoke that came in for a conference and said, yeah, I got to tell you how great it is to go into work and tell people in the offices next to me to Google my daughter's name and the New York Times and to see her responses come up. Um, so there, it just kind of started to take off in terms of it was authentic. It was something that um, students were, their work was being published. It wasn't in, you know, formal sense, but there, the stakes were a little bit higher. Um, and I think that 
increase the engagement as well. Um, I, I'll Jay, just jump in to say the number one thing that we hear from teachers is that everybody's looking for an authentic audience. And we offer that because you know your pieces are going to get read by Times editors. Um, and sometimes, as we'll talk about contests later, you know, across this company, not just on our site. So, anyway, right. go so, ahead. <laughs> Oh no, this is J this is Jay McGillan now jumping in. Um, yeah, I I think too, you know, for me as a t um, as a teacher, these are so great because they're authentic, they're real. The kids do it excited. You know, when we read through the Thursday uh, publications of the prompts, the kids get so excited. I don't have to come up with the prompts either. So practically speaking, as a teacher, <laughs> this is gold for me because yeah. you know they're real, they're authentic, and their their ideas that we all need to talk about they're relevant for the kids and I didn't have to make them so it's just a really wonderful <laughs> thing and they also you know just in terms of being a teacher and educating students um, not just for the test but it validates what we say that you know it's time for them to start being engaged with the world it's time for them to think about real issues and on a you know more mature level than they ever have before and the New York Times is saying the same thing and it's providing them a place where they can um, not only sort of read and react, but just hear what other students have to say. And for for me, and in the in the short time that I've been using these prompts, I think that that's that's the bit, the best part for me is that the kids realize that their writing and their comments uh, matter, and that they really do have to start becoming more engaged with the the world around them. Can, can I just and ask I you, Jay or John? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, go ahead, and then I'll then I'll ask my question. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that I think, too, it it works well in balancing that idea of, you know, where we're, Jay mentioned something about not just teaching to the test. You know, as a teacher of writing, we have to teach templates in, in a sense that you have to give students a place to, to start, but you hope that they begin to branch out from something that's overly formulaic. And what I think this has done, too, is we can talk about kind of anticipating how we might respond to something in a, like a time test situation or, you know, your standard five paragraph essay. But when we, when they respond to this, they're, they're inventing um, more than we're usually dictating kind of how they need to respond and how they need to write. But this is more authentic in the sense that they begin to own, well, how do I want to respond to it? It's, it's not going to be five paragraphs. It It's not going to fall one template. It's, it's my voice and I can even use the word I, you know, so it, it just kind of, it takes them into um, a, something that doesn't feel like it, it's based in so many rules and restrictions. And again, it just provides a certain level of freedom. So, so I was, I was going to ask this to John and Jay, but perhaps it's really for Megan and Ezra. I'm curious about practically speaking, how you're using these prompts in the classroom. Are you telling students answer Tuesday's prompt on the, on the State of the Union address, or are you saying to students choose any of the prompts from the past two weeks, or how, how do, are these for homework? Are they in the class? I'm just kind of curious about, practically speaking, what's the experience of using these prompts? Yeah, so this is Ezra, and I'm, I'm in the class this year, and it's the, the student questions are assigned as homework assignments, um for weeks here and there and they are often just done individually overnight and then sometimes the questions will be so engaging that they get brought up again <laughs> thanks, in class. what oh, thanks for saying thing. they're so engaging from a student point of view <laughs> no, they, they, they really are and I, I mean that because we, we'll come into school talking about them the next day i mean my classmates and it'll spark a a class discussion that will will take a good chunk of the class, and it's really nice to All be right, involved. Ezra, with... we'll yep. buy you lunch too. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, we had a heated so, discussion the other day. About, uh, parents using technology to monitor the kids. Everybody was really into that prompt that you put up there. Um, oh, so, really? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So I so. John, John might do it a little differently. One, we have a seven-day rotating cycle, so just about once per cycle, I will let them choose one of the prompts to write about. So that's how I use it. So uh, for the first semester, anyway, once per seven-day cycle, they'll they'll respond to 
any of the prompts from the, the days that haven't been, you know, from the days since the last one that they wrote. That's how I, that's how I use it. And it's independent. And second semester, I'll use it a little bit more directly in class when we talk specifically about argument, whereas we weren't focused on that so much during first, first semester. Got it. So, so Megan, why, I just put your slide up of one of the comments that, um, that I believe that we featured as part of our current events conversation, but maybe you could talk about that prompt or, or just in general what your experience has been with, uh, with responding to these prompts. Yeah, so I picked the um, prompt on race just because um, I want to talk a little bit about how the New York Times has like allowed me to express big political views um, I, and heavier topics. I think um, at the age of the mat right now, sometimes when we express our views on politics or heavier topics, oftentimes we're kind of, um, we receive criticisms or we're kind of squashed down just because of our age or lack of um, education. So these prompts allowed for self-expression and kind of forced me not to remain neutral anymore. Um, one of my like biggest um, pet peeves with arguments is when people make the um, claim that they can't take a stance on an issue because um, they're not educated enough on that topic. And I think that these prompts have forced me to um, escape or break away from that um, net, like that neutrality that um, a lot of people tend to kind of revert into. So it allowed uh, bigger issues such as race, which is um, what I wrote about, um, to become more accessible to me. Thanks. That's great. Uh, Megan, thank you. Um, I, I want to get to a couple questions that have come up in chat that are for John and Jay really quick. Uh, John and Jay, do you comment on every student response? And somebody else said, do you have students turn in their work or do you just check that it shows up online? So either both. Yeah, typically from a logistical standpoint, the thing that I have found that works best is they will respond to it. A lot of them will write it in like a Google Doc or a Word Doc, and then they'll, they have to be careful because there's a character limit, but they, they're pretty, you know, versed in how long the responses can be. But the reason they do that is because I require them, I create something on Google Classroom, which I think a lot of teachers use, in which I put the question out to the class, what did you write or respond to in the New York Times this week? Um, what did you have to say? And then what people will do is they'll cut and paste and respond in the New York Times, but they'll also cut and paste it into Google Classroom. So it becomes a conversation that I'll project up on the board. We'll read through um, the different issues that people in the class touched upon. And then it's also, you know, out there on the web. Um, but for me, I can go through and I can read and I can comment, you know, really in real time as we go through in a class, I can point out something that somebody did well or, you know, something, the way that somebody crafted a statement, how effective that was. Um, or, and then I can make sure I'm holding everybody accountable for actually doing it. So it streamlines it. It's right in front of me. Um, but they're also responding to the times. And then, you know, at other points we have them. They have to go in and respond to um, a, another person who also commented on the, the same issue. And I, I've been, a, this is Jay, I've been a little bit different. I have them turn it in on Google Classroom as well with a screenshot from their um, submission so that they have proof that it was actually authentic and submitted. Uh, but I've, I've really sort of, I read through them all on the on Google, but I I've really let this be mostly their own for at least for the first semester. Um, and I'll talk about some of the prompts and um, in class if if just to make conversation with the students about what they wrote about. But they've pretty much owned the process, um, and I, I sort of let them let them be to to write about uh, what they choose. And um, I just verify that they've done it. I just hold them accountable for that. Okay, and um, we're going to have some more time at the end for some Q&A, but I, uh, before we move on, I wanted to ask uh, Ezra or Megan, I know that you had mentioned a few other prompts that you were proud of uh, or that, that sort of stuck out in your own memory. I don't know if there's anyone or anything that you wanted to say uh, to the audience that you haven't said yet. 
Um, one of my favorite prompts that I did was um, also in response to um, travel and discussing why, um, what some, yes, it's right there, actually, um, <laughs> like some of the things that should be um, written about when somebody is traveling places. Um, and I think that that's great because um, I grew up on the road, so I've been to a multitude of places. So that was a really accessible prompt for me. I was able to discuss experiences that I've had, which is kind of interesting since in school oftentimes we're writing essays and it's not so much personal. Um, so that was really great for me to be able to discuss my own personal experiences, what I've learned from them, and then um, my view on like a, a broader scale. Yeah, like like Megan said about um, about the travel topic, I think it's great to be able to express your own views and values. And I think that's one of the things that you see oftentimes with the questions is the it, it opens it up for the student to give what they really think and that forces a lot of kids to maybe think about things that they haven't thought of in that way. And to to reflect on your own values is an important thing. And I've been able to do that through a lot of these questions. So. All right. Um, well, we're, hopefully we'll be able to hear from all of you uh, at, toward the end again when we have our Q&A. But we're just going to move on because we have a few other prompts that we want to be able to touch on briefly. Um, we, we don't actually call them uh, writing prompts per se on our site. We, we identify them as multimedia. You can find them under the, in the yellow camera icon on the front of our homepage. And when you click on multimedia, uh, one of the prompts that you will find, it's a weekly prompt, it's called What's Going On in This Picture? This is definitely one of our most popular prompts that we offer. Every uh, Sunday night now and Monday morning, we publish a new photograph. We strip it of its caption. So it appeared in the New York Times anywhere between 1851 and today. <laughs> and we strip it of its caption and we ask students three questions. Uh, the first question is, what's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? And what more can you find? And we love these questions. They're open-ended. They ask students to look closely at the image, to look for the details to support their analysis. And every Monday, we actually have a conversation online on the site that's live moderated by the organization Visual Thinking Strategies. Moderators are on during the school day, Eastern time, from 9 till 2, and they respond to students. And uh, teachers and students tell us it's very exciting to get, uh, to get pointed out by, a mo by one of the moderators. The moderators will ask students to back up their opinions, to validate, they, they validate what students have to say, and they generally push students to think more deeply and to look more closely and to encourage a civil conversation. We found that through this live moderation method that the conversation has just gotten richer and richer over the years. Students are responding to one another. In fact, we have some students coming on as acting as student moderators, yeah. in fact, unofficial, but they have borrowed the language from the VTS moderators and are pushing other students from other schools or from their own school to think more deeply and to look more closely at the image and to back up what, what they have to say. And that's really been uh, a neat experience. We literally can have in the thousands of comments per week for one of these images. And just like our prompts, we've collected uh, many of these images into a slideshow of intriguing photographs that teachers have told us uh, they found to be very, very helpful uh, in sparking conversation and in getting students to write. So I, we wanted to talk about that as one of our prompts. We also offer um, uh, another prompt that grew out of our success, really, of, with what's going on in this picture, and that's called what's going on in this graph. So uh, we don't have that many math teachers in the room, and that's unfortunate, but really these graphs can be used for any subject, and they as well ask students to look very closely. For this, we ask similar questions. What do you notice? What do you wonder? And then what's going on in this graph? They're open-ended questions, so students can really start with where they're at. Uh, they can notice the colors. They can notice that there are lines in it, and then maybe they can move on to noticing that it's a histogram or a scatter plot or a line graph. Um, these conversations are also live moderated on Wednesdays. We have educators from the American Statistical Association doing live moderation, and very similar to, to what's going on in this uh, picture, they are pushing students to look more closely, to think more deeply, and to flesh out their analysis of what they see going on. The graph can be about really anything. The one we actually had a conversation earlier today, it was about music consumption by genre. And uh, we have students 
from, uh, for example, I know that there were students from a social studies class joining in today from New Jersey, and the teacher told us that he uses this because uh, he, it helped, he knows that the graphs appear on the AP exam, and he wants students to be better at in image analysis and better at uh, political cartoon analysis and graph analysis, and it's a really fun way to get students uh, to be thinking this way. And just like our, 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 the prompts that we mentioned before and are what's going in this picture, it really is that open-ended supportive community. So we wanted to be sure to mention that. Um, I, I want to read out something Karen H. just said in the chat, uh, since you guys are humanities teachers, she points out the graphs are actually great resources for AP language synthesis essay test uh, because students have to interpret at least one infographic as part of that prompt. Yes, thanks, Karen. And, and, and believe it or not, we, we actually had a graph. I remember around Valentine's Day last year, we published yeah. um, the words the, the related to love and relationships that were used in, in, in the modern uh, love the, column. The modern love column. So it's kind of fascinating. It was really an interesting word analysis to yeah. see what words were being used. I think by they divided it by gender. I mm -hmm. think what ones men were submitted and what words women tended to use. It was fascinating. So, um, you know, we, we try to surprise teachers and students and have interesting graphs and really cover a range of topics. There's one other multimedia feature that I want to make sure that we mention, which is our film club. Uh, so on Thursdays, we publish a new film that was, uh, that was uh, already published in the Times somewhere. So here you can see an op-ed uh, that Jay-Z created, The War on Drugs is an Epic Fail. I think it lasts under three minutes but it gives plenty for students to watch, to think about, and respond to. And uh, we've talked to an English teacher in Central Florida who uses these, these films regularly, I think in his AP language and composition class. The films are under 10 minutes almost always, and they average around seven to eight minutes. So they're really quite quick to be able to show in class or have students watch, whether for homework or, or during the class time. And then students do the same type of writing that they would do with our prompts or what's going in this picture. They're, they're responding to these films and they're, they're, they're able to support their interpretations with evidence and details from the film. They're able to put in their own opinions. And uh, it's, again, in this supportive environment where students can read one another's comments and respond to each other. Uh, this week, in fact, we're publishing, one other thing I want to say before we move on to the next category is we're publishing a film that's about, um, I think, a, a healer in Kashmir. So I wanted to emphasize that these, these films are, are not only short and easy to get into the classroom, but they really cover a range of topics. They introduce students to, to places and people from around the world, and it's a great way to really bring a global education into the classroom. So again, let me hand it over to Catherine, who's going to talk about our contests, which are very much related to writing as well. But we're going to talk about them very quickly um, because we are going to run out of time. Okay. Um, so, so we've introduced you to what I essentially, I'm a, a member of the National Writing Project since 1987, people. Um, so I believe in nothing more than I believe in uh, lots of low stakes writing, as it's known. And I think that our um, all the things that we have shown you so far is is very much low stakes writing, right? You're just putting your comments into the site, and we don't we're not at all concerned about grammar, punctuation, and spelling, and so far, you know, as long as we can read what kids are trying to say. Um, we do have a higher level, though, the kind of high stakes writing um, in our contests, and we have added more and more and more contests every year because they are so popular and talk about authentic audience for these. It's not just our staff, but we get experts in whatever field the contest is in to judge the contest. So uh, you know that if you do an editorial cartoon, for example, we just finished that contest, that actual uh, you know, professional editorial cartoonists are looking at your work. Now, um, because of time and because this is focused on writing, we're not going to talk about all the genres we do, but um, you can check out our contest calendar and you'll see, um, hang on, oh yeah, sorry, the little red line here is where you can access all this, down the bottom right hand um, fifth icon there. Um, let's see, okay, so you see this picture. This is our, like one of the most popular things we publish every year. We publish it in August, we do not deviate. It's our contest calendar for the year with all the dates when things are due. Um, and we are always running a contest. When one closes, another opens. They each run for about a month. And just so you don't, so your students don't get crazy, it takes us about a month and a half to judge them. Because for some of them, we get 
10,000 entries, and we are a, a staff of four. Um, so, so you know, don't come at us for have how patience. long. Yeah, yeah. Have patience. please have patience. Um, anyway, we do many. We do editorial cartoons. Right now we're running the vocabulary video contest, which just requires you to make a 15-second video defining one of our words of the day. Um, we'll have a found poetry contest later that you'll use a print New York Times for because I know that the Danvers people are doing found poetry anyway. Um, we've already done a review contest. What have we? Fin- what else have we finished? Review. Well, we've done the cartoon, the review, the connections contest. Oh, we you just finished. Okay, so we just finished. These are the writing contests we run. We just finished the connections contest, which is the fourth one listed. So simple. We just say to kids, connect anything you've studied in school this semester to anything in the news this year. And those are so fun to judge. I mean, we're in the middle now, like. Um, I'm thinking of some winners from last year. The Crucible uh, comp- connected to fake news, how a community can be like undone by uh, insufficient information, basically. Uh, another one, This I always mention this is my one of my favorites ever. A, a student said um, Newton's first law of motion, you know, an object in motion will remain in motion. The kid connected that to the Me Too movement and how it just kind of snowballed. So, it's not even just the connection. It's kind of what the kid says about the connection. But anyway, that's a, a blast to, um, to judge. The editorial contest, is the top one listed here, is coming up right as this one ends, and it's as, uh, when the vocabulary ends. It starts February 21st. It's easily the most popular one, I think, and that's because kids all need to do argumentative writing across the curriculum these days. So um, kids can pick any issue they care about at all, Uh, It's a very short editorial, 450 words, um, and we will probably get 12,000 entries this year. But uh, don't despair in advance because we recognize many, 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 many winners. Like we have top 10, then we have runners up, then we have honorable mentions, then we have a whole extra level of kids that just advance that we want to know. We want them to know they wrote something so good it advanced to the next level. So, um, Let's check that out. Um, review contest is already over, but they can review anything that the Times reviews. That could be anything from a restaurant to a movie to an album to a dance performance to a building. Um, also great. And then in the summer, super open-ended. If you already are telling kids for your summer reading that they need to read a novel, it's an easy way to add choice nonfiction. It runs for 10 weeks. Every week is a separate contest. We just ask, what interested you most in the Times this week and why? And that's really the ones that win. Uh, we've been doing it almost 10 years now. The ones that win really turn out to be kids that can make a personal connection to the news in some way. And that's really why what kids surface. They're interested in the opioid crisis because they know somebody in their community who's been affected or You know, they're interested in, uh, like, something in the food section because they love to cook. Anyway, that's a very um, open-ended contest in the sense that they can literally pick anything, and we don't care at all, if you know, which section their choice comes from. We just care what they have to say about it. So, okay. And then we'll say thank you for participating. Thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. I hope you found this helpful, and you can uh, please click around on the Learning Network. We hope you use this resource with your students and in your school. Tell your colleagues and uh, other educators that you know. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye.